Promotional support provided by Edible Jersey, a quarterly magazine and online publication celebrating the local food of the Garden State for 15 years. Learn more at EdibleJersey.com. Ah, the Philippines. An island nation made up of over 7,000 islands spread over 120,000 square miles. White sand beaches, crystal blue waters. Such a peaceful place, full of warm, welcoming people. So what's with all the hand-to-hand -hand combat? Now you know what I'm gonna say. The answer can be found right here in New Jersey. I'm here at the Newark Museum, which hosts all kinds of incredible events from the Black Film Festival to planetarium programming for kids and adults. But today, it's all about the Filipino culture, featuring visual artist and martial artist Francis Estrada. Tikiti Tersha Kali is the type of martial art. It's a close quarter fighting system. Tikiti means to getting close, and Tersha to me means to quarters. It's used by the Special Action Force. It's uh, they're like uh, the Army Rangers of the Philippines. So we're not messing around here. We're no. gonna. <laughs> Karate chop somebody <laughs> down. Our intention in Pikiti Tersha is to get out of the way, move off at an angle, and be in a position where I can hit without being hit. How do I defend myself? All right. And where was this with my with my middle school bullies? That's what I want to know. Okay, so first, imagine those bullies. Okay, <laughs> I'm picturing them right imagine now. Imagine what they may have done. <laughs> a common combination is a jab and a cross, right? Yep. So if I throw a jab and a cross, I'm not going to hit you, but I'm going to aim for your nose. I'll throw a jab and a cross. That's Pretty common, right? So jab and across. So if you do the same thing to me, yeah. <laughs> so, so I move this out of the way. Oh. So that's one of the slaps, but I move this out of the way, and if this comes out, I go here, but then you're in line oh. for that slap right there. Oh, that works. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a way of being more direct. If you throw that jabbing on with the right, I can move here and real quickly get that slap. Wow. Okay. And yeah. what if somebody comes from you from behind, like a coward? Yeah. <laughs> then what? <laughs> so that's where the situa situational awareness comes to play. For example, I tell people, don't wear headphones, don't cover um, uh, your line of vision, because from here, I, my peripherals can go up to here. What but got you into Bikini Tersha? It's actually art. I was working on some art projects, and I was looking specifically at anything that's traditional Filipino. I started doing all these drawings, I was doing paintings, but then I realized to understand it better, I had to know how to move. In 2010, Francis took a six-month sabbatical to learn the art of Bikiti Tersha. He eventually made his way to the Philippines, learning from the masters themselves. Now, Francis himself is a master and has earned the name Guru which means teacher in Filipino. He says with the growth of Asian hate, a consequence from the COVID-19 pandemic, enrollment in Pekiti self-defense classes have gone way up. Do you see that confidence build when, you, when you're teaching individuals how to protect themselves? Do you see that confidence building like, okay, maybe I, I can handle myself? Yeah, and I see it with, uh, with the participants. You know, sometimes uh, the workshops that I did, we had families. We had, you know, little kids with their parents. Even little kids? Yeah. Wow. So I teach them just how to get out of the way, how to protect themselves, how to cover and go. There's a sense of confidence that you have when you know how to move. Mm -hmm. And if you have that confidence, you're not going to get nervous if a situation uh, arises. Mm -hmm. You can remain calm. So can you give me like a full out something? Here we go. Training montage. So once that's here, oh. I can go <laughs> and bring you down <laughs> gently. Gently. <laughs> Lord have mercy. It's like a dance. It's like a dance. <laughs> Only a dance that you're gonna get your yeah. butt kicked so in. So once again, you move this out of the way. With this hand. Slap. Slap. Now slap the kidney. Slap And you kidney. notice my bounce is already off. And Left hand. Slaps the kidney. Slaps the kidney. There you go, see that push? Right. Simple enough. Getting tossed around like a rag doll really works up an appetite. Chris from the popular Crazy Chef food truck is here, slinging seasig for me and Francis. Traditionally made with pig face and chicken liver, it's a classic Filipino dish. Chris has updated his recipe, leaving the pig face in the past, but hasn't skimped on any of the flavor. How you doing? Good, good. How are you? I'm starving. Okay. What are my options? Well, I got you the good stuff. It's the chicken seasig and the pork seasig. I'll give you half and half. Okay. Best of both worlds. Now, how do you make your seasig? 
with love. <laughs> okay. Come on. So what did you eat when you were growing up? It's a lot of pork we ate in the Philippines. You know, there's not so many places to raise cattle, but you know, pig, pigs are easier to, uh, to raise. So a lot of seafood and a lot of uh, pigs. Nice. Mm hmm. Mm. Yeah, delicious. That's really good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Chris. <laughs> the last name is Strata. I don't think Filipino. I think Spanish. Yes. And and that that's a thing that many Filipinos have Spanish names. Yeah, I mean, when the Spanish took over, you know, one way of colonizing was to erase history, also erase names. So they had us to, they had people choose names from a list. So these are the names that you can use. So you can't just choose any name. You weren't appointed names, but you were given the names that you can use. Mm -hmm. There's a joke. We say that Filipinos are very hospitable. So hospitable that we let so many countries take over. <laughs> <laughs> Once a stop over for traders and merchants, Chinese settlers, Muslim traders, the Spanish, the U.S., the Japanese, and even the British have at one time or another invaded or inhabited the Philippines, all leaving their mark, culinary or otherwise. The Philippines used to be part of the United States. Yeah. So did you find there to be a very stark contrast with what you thought America was going to be like in terms of treatment and then what it actually was? Oh, definitely. You know, uh, when I, we were about to move to, uh, to the U.S., we were in the Philippines. We were excited. And so, you know, the Philippines see us as brothers, we're equals. And of course, everything changed by the time I moved over here. So then there's, that came that idea of, okay, well, I had this vision of living in America, being American, being part of the society, and, you know, being slapped in the face with reality. My family ended up settling. It was a suburb of a suburb of Scranton, Pennsylvania called Honesdale. Mm -hmm. so, it sounds, sounds pretty homogenous, mm -hmm. if I could Very say that. Yes. Now, how, how are we getting tamarind and fish sauce? How are we getting that? There was no place to, uh, to get tamarind. So we had to play around with how do we get that sourness? So we used different citrus. Um, we used lemons, if we can, just uh, substituting a few things. Uh, for example, I didn't know where to get bok choy. So uh, we substituted with uh, cabbage instead. Mm -hmm. And this all has led you into becoming an artist where you've, you really showcase your, your culture and I guess what the Filipino culture has been through mm -hmm. over the years through your art. And tell me about that, the Coney Island one that you, that you made. I found out that in 1905, in Coney Island in Luna Park, they actually had uh, a human zoo where they showed people from uh, the Bontoc region, the mountains of the Philippines. And they were basically a spectacle for, uh, for people to come visit and come check them out half clothed. Wow. So I then decided to create uh, this piece um, where I had a mannequin painted it brown, but there's a map of Luna Park so they can kind of find their way out. And the idea is for me thinking of an escape for them. So you know, I couldn't do it back then, but I'm making artwork now to kind of remedy what happened in the past. It has to go beyond representation, right? Because you can represent someone, you can show someone, but if there's no understanding, it kind of ends and stops at that point. So I think, yes, we are starting, but we still have a long way to go. So I've had my first course of Filipino culture, but now it's time for the main course. And that's led me here to Maricel's Kitchen. Mm, smells <laughs> like home cooking. The second I stepped foot in this gorgeous kitchen, I was being fed. I want you to taste this one. It smells like something my mom would make, because we make this um, okra soup as well, That, but we don't do pork belly, but we do cow foot. Oh my god, my favorite. Well, this was good. So molo means wonton that we make. Now, some people would just take this and dump it in the broth. We're not doing that okay. because I want to up the level of my pancit molo. It's getting ready. Look, 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 nicey, nicey. Are you whipping up pork rinds? Yes. What? Yes, oh, that's the Filipino Did you fish. add the pork rind to this, or the, is that standard? No, I added that. I haven't had a pork rind in like 15 years. Bye. Mm. Okay. Just a little kick, you know, okay. different change. That's what we call Filipino hospitality. It's our tradition, it's a cultural thing. It's like, it's very basic. We like to feed people. Meet Maricel Gentile, chef and owner of Maricel's Kitchen. She teaches cooking classes, caters special events, runs her own food truck, and has still found the time to give me a private lesson in Filipino cuisine. Now that is the immigrant hustle. So Marisol, who taught you how to cook? My grandmother. 
my grandmother is the best. She didn't measure. Like when I was starting my cooking classes, I had a hard time writing my recipes like, oh my God. So when I cook, it's, it's just spontaneous. It's just boom, boom, it's just boom, like, boom, boom. I can't stop. It's just like when I cook, it just comes down. It's just like Muscle my grandmother. Memory. There's a picture of me as a baby on the kitchen counter with my mom. Me too, I got that picture. Oh my God. We're gonna start cooking. Okay. I'm seat. What is Rice that? noodle. I'm gonna teach you how to wrap egg rolls. Okay. So we're making two kinds of lumpia. We got it from the Chinese, like the ninth century. I'm it, learning something new every it, day. It's everywhere, egg rolls. It, it. It's a staple in the Philippine cuisine. See? Well, let's do pancit first. All right. Oh, we're all, how many dishes am I doing? Right I don't know what. So, <laughs> I don't know, you tell me. Where? Unhappy in the corporate world, Mary Cell ditched the nine to five and started her catering business, Mary Cell's Kitchen, at the age of 52 and never looked back. She says she knew instantly this was what she was meant to do. You're pretty, you're a big deal. We've got a test kitchen, we've got a food <laughs> truck. I was like, and I literally said, I was like, I think Maricel is a Filipino yeah, kind of yeah, garden. Yeah, yeah, mm, whoa, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, right, I wish. I mean, we, everyone knows Chinese food. Everyone's looking for Korean barbecue. Why do you think Filipino food hasn't really, really broken out like that? There's not a lot of people that would want to open up a Filipino, because we Filipinos, we always say, Home cooking is better. <laughs> so, but I like to introduce Filipino food because I am proud of the Filipino cuisine. I feel like Filipino is like a, a melting pot of just different cultures and different Spanish, foods. Spanish. Well, Spanish a little. little Chinese. Exactly. And, and, and then we also have the real ethnic uh, kind of food. So what is next? So what's next? Okay. Rice noodles. Pork belly. Liven it up a little bit. You could mix before it yep. burns. We'll do the onions. Garlic, of course, we Lots love of garlic. garlic, of course. Can't be shy with garlic. When you're sauteing, you see how I think the onions are still hard? Mm -hmm. Then when you're making this, you got to make it translucent. That's when all the flavors are being squeezed out, squeezed out of those nice onions. Well, onions are the best, too. So now we're going to put this here. Okay. Soak it like that. Yeah. yeah. You're getting there. You're getting there. I hope I don't mess up. I'm trying, no, I'm, you're I'm not. Trying to you're not. Here. You are impressing me right now. <laughs> okay. Still, still. Still not done. Still not done. There's no al dente in Asian noodles. <laughs> Can you slice this thin strips, and then we're gonna ready to plate this already. Oh, this thing is loaded. Good. So this would just go straight to the table, yeah. family style. It's family style eating. Would that work? Exciting. And wait, tell me again. You still what this have is two called. more things to make. I know. <laughs> so we gotta hurry I'm this. Just watching we gotta hurry this up. What's this called again? Pancit bihon. Pancit bihon. Okay. It's really good. The pork belly. Don't skip on the pork belly. I'm not. I'm not. I'm That's not. the pork. <laughs> All right. Let me drop this. Hold on. Hold on. No, one more bite. One more bite. One more bite. Delicious. One more bite. Ah! It's good, right? Mm-hmm. I, know, I also this. make a salad. True to her word, Maricel will not stop until I'm completely full. We're moving on to another Filipino staple. Lumpia. Lumpia. Every Filipino. Every Filipino. Every. <laughs> you cannot miss this. I put ground pork, cabbage, bean sprouts, mm. sweet potato, carrots. Let me start low. <laughs> I Training smell wheels. My Training oil. wheels. Yes. You take this. Right. This end, okay, put it over, like roll it over and push it back so it gets tight. Hold on, and push it. Now, when you fold, you make sure you fold that one side like this so it closes the, the edge of that. Because if it's like you fold it like this, the vegetable would come out. Oh, that's nice. This is good. That's, you got it. You got it. You got it. Got it. And how long do these? Oh, oh look at this perfect one. Yeah, I think that one's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> I'm gonna show you how we eat it. So we bite from the top and we do like this. Oh. It's very hot. How crunchy is that, right? Oh, God. With the I vinegar? Love that. Oh, God. Mm. I can speak. That's all I want to see from you. 
that you, you're speechless. The aromas of Maricel's lumpia have attracted her husband, Paul, into the kitchen. You were actually in culinary school. I was, yes. I was so, the one who was studying how to cook. So <laughs> why is Marisol in the kitchen, and why am I not seeing you at the fryer? Have you tasted her food yet? <laughs> I, have, I have tasted it. That's exactly so why. So you a step back? If you notice, the kitchen was built for her. This is her kitchen. I was going to say, I did hit my head on this, so yeah. <laughs> this was not up for me. When the contractor was here, she stood there, and then we moved the hood up and down till it was in the right spot. She's the most passionate person you'll find about food. And it comes through. You know what? Other people can cook, but she puts love. Every piece is love in here. I could spend all day with just Mary Sal, but I've got to introduce you to another Filipino icon of New Jersey, Ludi de Assis Hughes. She's the founder and chairwoman of the annual Filipino American Festival, which is all about educating people about Filipino culture. And she's here to show me how the Filipino sausage gets made, literally. Okay, so what are we making today? Lukban longanisa. Longanisa. Uh, yeah, longanisa, also called garlic uh, sausage. The longanisa is eaten in the morning with, of course, with fried rice and with eggs. Mm, breakfast that's, champions. That's, that's a breakfast meal in the Philippines that's very famous for that. Filipinos cook all the time with meat and veggies because mm -hmm. we can't eat the whole steak because it's very expensive. But as long as there's veggies and a little bit of meat, mm -hmm. they're, they're happy. When Ludi said we'd be making sausage, I was thinking meat grinders, kitchen tools, there's none of that. Ludi dices her meat by hand. Now that is old school. This is the key. This is the key? Yeah, this is Correct. the oregano. Mmm. This is the key to this uh, longanisa. There's nothing more intimate than stuffing sausages together. That's when the real talk goes down. Of course, what happened is because of the rhetoric that happened in the COVID. Mm -hmm. We are facing two dilemma right now, the Asian American. One is COVID-19 and one is Asian hate, you know? Mm -hmm. So we need to stop the Asian hate. According to advocacy group Stop AAPI Hate, from March 2020 to December 2021, there were almost 11,000 bias incidents against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. What were you feeling? What were you thinking when all this began? That's what I'm saying. It could happen to me. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just want to make sure that there is a tougher law so that uh, to, to prevent all this uh, hate crime. New Jersey is making sure there is a seat at the table for all our Asian brothers and sisters. In January, New Jersey's Governor Phil Murphy signed legislation requiring schools to create and implement an AAPI-inclusive curriculum to be taught from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. I think I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. We now have 1.05 million Asian Americans. Really? In Bergen County alone. Mm -hmm. So in order for us to fight this uh, Asian hate, we need to get together. And those aren't just empty words. Ludi brought a literal Asian American party to Maricel's backyard. And this intimate cultural lesson is about to become a classic Filipino feast, complete with lechon. Now this is a lot of food. Maricel and I had no idea these people were coming. But my Filipino education isn't quite complete. Paul fills me in on the cultural exchange that's brought lechon to America. The lechon, right, mm -hmm. is normally in the Philippines would be in Cebu. They're famous for their lechon, right? When you go to Cebu, you can go through a town and there's the roasted pigs everywhere. But if you're here in the United States, people say, well, how do I do that? Well, there's a, the Cubans and the Chinese put together what they call the La Caja China. And when the Chinese went to Cuba, 
They taught the Cubans how to roast pigs in a box. Yeah. Well, I, have a, I live in an apartment, so I'll just come to your house. You just come here. <laughs> just we've, come got, to your house. We've, got, we've got the roasting box. And this is the whole point of Maricel's Kitchen and the Filipino culture. We make a huge amount of food, and people come from all over to eat. When roast pig is on the menu, people just seem to turn up. Like Ludi said, now is the time for all Asian cultures to come together. So I'm learning more about the culture that's had so much influence on the Philippines. China, the land of dragons. But when I showed up, I realized I had the story completely wrong. Well, James, I think the biggest question, because I told you for years and years and years, I've called this the dragon dance. And it's not a dragon, it's a lion. Please tell me I'm not the only one confused. Yes, so we've heard that my entire life between the dragon dance and lion dance. So what you see behind us is the traditional Chinese lion dance. So the difference between a lion dance and a dragon dance, lion dance is two people playing in the costumes. You have the head and the tail. And the dragon is typically nine people holding a pole with the long body of the dragon and huge head and uh, is more like a parade-style movement uh, with the dragon. Although its specific origins have been lost to time and legend, most historians believe lion dancing began in the Han Dynasty in 200 BC. By 600 AD, the lion dance became a distinguishing form of entertainment and often performed for the imperial court. Today, the lion dance has appeared throughout Asia and the world thanks to Chinese immigration. What does it mean that it's lasted this long? What does that mean to your culture? It brings an interest, because a lot of times when we're back in, oh, over here in America, we lose a lot of our culture um, just because we're, we're born here, we're into an American culture. This is one way we can link back to our, our past. You know, over the last two or so years, we've seen a spike in Asian American hate and everything like that. Have you, have you seen a, a, a boost in membership, a decline? Getting a lot of new students have been pretty difficult because of all the uh, fear of Asian hate crime. Um, but we're, we're, our team is still going strong, and, and uh, we're not going to let those things deter us. Let's practice this first. So you're going to go ahead. You're going to keep your hands up just like this. Okay. You're going to take a little hop, right, like this. Okay. Good. Now let's go as high as you can. You're going to go this and jump. Back straight. Good. Now you see if you can go like like that. No. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. And I'm doing legs forward. Yeah, man. We're going. Ready? We're not, okay, yeah, we're going. Okay, we're remember, going. hop forward a little, like this, right? Hop forward when you're ready, okay? And Are you go. ready? Yep. All right. Good job. Now, I feel like that was a little terrible. Yeah, we'll, we'll get better. We'll yeah, get yeah. better at it. Well, I think we can go to the next level. Okay, start with the left side forward. Ready? Ready, go forward, back, circle, in. Now switch. In, circle, back, back, switch. In, circle, and down. Down. Excellent. Max, how old are you? Eight. Eight? And you doing parades? Four miles in a costume? Lord. So we do the, uh, the dance parade during May and the Chinese New Year parades in February. Mm -hmm. I know the camera's all right. Is he tough? Is he a tough instructor? <laughs> he gets on you, right? <laughs> Oh, you, you just blink twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not. I'm not afraid. There you go. Yeah. yeah. You can even let this rest on your neck, just like that. Good. Gotcha. Move. Sit right there. And you gonna give me your fingers. Yep. Hold that, just like that. Oh, that's how the mouth opens. Yeah. Hey. Open it. All right. <laughs> and since you're getting pro, you can even pull on this with one hand. Pull it. You got your eyes blinking. Oh. Got it? <laughs> yep. All right. OK. Remember what we said, OK? Easy jump, legs forward, back straight, spot your jump, and land on your feet. OK. Ready, and go. Excellent. Good job. Woo. 
one of the most important things is, is, is that uh, is, this is one of our only ways to keep our tradition and keep our connection with our culture. Just enjoy it. And if you get a chance to learn more about it, absolutely do it. So and anybody can just come down. Yeah, absolutely. Black, white, Hispanic. Yes. If they want to learn this. So word on the street is that you are not Chinese in any sort of way. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's true. How do you feel doing these dances for a culture that you're not a part of? Well, I think ultimately it's kind of the great thing about living in such a multicultural community is because, you know, as a non-Chinese person, I'm able to get involved in so much of Chinese culture and Chinese art and learn so much about it and really kind of like be in an environment where I'm able to treat a culture that's not mine like as my own. And so I think that being able to do it and being able to pass it on to people, whether they're Chinese or not, is something that is really incredible about doing Lion Dance and also kind of what this whole organization does as well. So I think that being able to pass down these traditions, both from my own culture, from Chinese culture, and so many other cultures that are slowly dying down and they go through generation to through generation, I feel like it's definitely made me value the things that my family does to celebrate our own ethnicity and our own culture and to just kind of continue doing that and making sure to do that with the next generation as well. What a learning experience this has been. I've learned how to defend myself, Pekiti Tersha style, to eat every part of the pig, to cook some classic Filipino staples, and that all of us, no matter where we come from, are inextricably connected. I was looking specifically at anything that's traditional Filipino. Um, I was looking at visual arts, and then I got very interested in movement <gasps> arts. <laughs> oh, see, I caught him. I caught him. But I know the space. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, I'm listening. Promotional support provided by Edible Jersey, a quarterly magazine and online publication celebrating the local food of the Garden State for 15 years. Learn more at ediblejersey.com.